church was completed in 1876 and this organ, brand new Bins organ, was installed in 1899 into this chamber beneath the tower. The unique thing, the special thing about this organ is it's almost in unaltered condition from when it was put here in 1899 and that's why it's got a grade 2 organ certificate. It's basically worn out, it was last restored fully in 1952 so all of the leather motors inside the organ need replacing and there's various bits of it aren't working very well. The current state is it's been dismantled, uh, ready for us to restore the organ back in Huddersfield. So it's very much a restoration, a faithful restoration to return the organ to the state it was, was when it was built. Each rank of pipes was carefully removed, um, put into crates and taken back to our workshop where it'll be cleaned, the speech reset, straightened up. Then once the pipes are all out, then we take up the boards that the pipes stand on and remove all of them. It's a matter of carefully taking it apart in a, in a sort of in a program, and, um, and then returning it the same way. It's built by a, an organ builder from Leeds, from Bramley, a man called James Jepson Bins. Yeah, there's a personal link for me with J.J. Bins in that the man who taught me to voice was a man called Norman Fitton. He was taught to voice by J.J. Bins. Um, so I do feel that there's a sort of link going back to his work. We're very lucky to have, have the J.J. Bins ledgers here, um, which have come down to me from, from, from various people. Um, they're the workshop ledgers, that are all, all written by J.J. Bins, and we have them from his organ number 49, through until uh, the last organ he made in 1929 when he died. Uh, so he started in 1881. So when this organ was made in 1899, it was to a well-established pattern with a team of craftsmen who really knew what they were doing. We can see that um, Mr. Fisher was responsible for the pipework being made here. We know what wind pressure it was on. We know what the scales were. So it's an invaluable source of information for us. The only photographs I know of, of of the bins team, this is the voicing room where there are trumpets and oboes hanging from the roof, ready to be voiced. This man is Tim Wadsworth, who was from Huddersfield, and his, these photographs came to me from his grandson. It's really three organs in one. Um, we've got the, the great organ here, played by this keyboard or manual, and then the upper keyboard plays the swell organ. And then down at my feet, um, we've got the pedal organ, which uh, you operate with your feet. If you're a, an organist, this must be really quite demanding to play three instruments in one. To create a sound, what happens is air is blown through a pipe these are the large pipes on the great diapason. If I take this one out, I think it's a B. I should be able to blow in here and make the pipe sound. It takes a lot of blowing, that one. 58 notes, that means there have to be 58 individual pipes to create that sound. And that's called a rank of pipes. Now this great organ actually has six ranks of pipe. And the reason that there are further ranks of pipe is because each rank has a different um, musical tone or musical quality or colour associated with the way that the pipes are being constructed. So when I press that note, six pipes are sounding. If, if I don't want all six pipes to sound, I can stop them. And this is where you use the organ stop. So I can hold that note down and I now press in the organ stops and uh, I'll stop the six pipes one after another. So yeah, all the stops are in. I've still got my finger on the key, but it's not playing. This instrument, in total, has got, we believe, 674 pipes, um, which, believe it or not, actually makes it a small organ. Uh, a typical cathedral organ could easily have four to 5,000 pipes. This is a restored pedal chest from the Great Aiton organ. 
you can quite clearly see that all the pneumatic motors within the chest have all been recovered in leather, all the valves made new and all the linkages are new. The pallets which are pulled down by the pneumatic motor are all new and it's all ready to go. This one's actually under wind at the moment, we can see quite clearly how it works. The primary action is this small pneumatic motor at the bottom of the chest which is activated by a puff of wind which comes from the touch box. That inflates this pneumatic motor and makes it rise. That in turn will lift this valve which will empty the air out of the main power motor and pull the pallet down. Quite simply, like this. As you can see around you, we've got most of the organ back here now in the workshop and we're starting to work on all the component parts of it for the restoration. The main part of what we're doing at the moment are the manual soundboards. These are the chests which contain all the pipe work and the action inside them which actually make the organ work. The internal motors which you've seen um, on the underside of the action we strip off the old leather completely and we use um, different grades of leather for the different purposes we want. We use a very fine leather called split skin. We're fortunate to have a good, good leather supplier in Northamptonshire who supplies every grade of leather we need. Well, a great problem on this organ is that wind has been getting from one channel into the next channel into the next channel so that when you pressed one note Actually, the air was being spread out. It wasn't just going to that one note, it was going into the next channel. Part of what's happened over the last 40, 50 years has been trying to deal with this without actually taking the organ right apart and dealing with the problem um, fundamentally, you know, because what we will do is uh, flood this, the grids from underneath with, with hot glue. We run it into the note channels so that it fills up the, 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 uh, the groove or the, in, in this soundboard, and then we let all the glue run out again. One unexpected surprise that we found um, when we started taking the organ out was that some of the feet of the great flutes, and these, these are the bases of the gedact on the grate, and the board on on the grate, have been badly um, affected by a woodworm. In fact, on some of these pipes, They've eaten so much of the foot that we're going to have to make new feet because they're so thin, it's like tissue paper. Since your last visit here, we've been very busy in the workshop, as you can see. And the main um, thrust of what we've been doing is the restoration of the three main components of the organ, the two manual soundboards. This one's a swell, the great one over there that Brian's busy working on, and the pedal chest, which is now complete. The leatherwork has been completely replaced. The felts have all been renewed. The pallets have all been remade. There have been various things that we found that, 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 that did surprise us. In, when you restore an organ like we are doing now, um, very often you get lost, it becomes a mass of complex mechanisms and wind connections and key actions and pedal actions and stop actions and you lose sight of it as a musical instrument. So only right at the end, when everything is set up and we're doing the final tuning, you suddenly remember, yes, this is, this is actually a musical instrument, it's not just a machine. Today is really exciting because we've got the organ back after um, six months of the organ restorers doing their fantastic work. 
And what, some three years after we started the project to raise the money, we've actually got the organ back, so it's fantastic. Well, it's nice to have it back because um, it fills the church with music. Um, music's a wonderful thing, it pulls upon the emotions. Uh, and it's, just, it's wonderful to have it back. It's much brighter than it was before, and it's ready for another 50 years.